Hey, everybody. Ten years ago, when I last walked the hills of this illustrious campus, I never thought that 10 years later, I would get married, let alone have a kid. 10 years ago, all I really wanted was a boyfriend, a real relationship, instead of just a situationship. I wasn't even thinking about kids, no parts of them. By the age of 21, I had never even held a newborn. But you can't change the past, nor can you predict the future. So when I graduated from FSU in 2008, I left with just the degree I came here for. And three months later, I moved to Amarillo, Texas, where I began my first news job. In the tiny West Texas city, where the locals say the smell of cow manure in the morning is the smell of money, and the siding of a wind farm is as common as the siding of an actual farm or a prairie dog or a jackrabbit, that is where I met my now husband. And after a few months of dating, as cliche as it may sound, I said to myself, I would have his babies. <laughs> now, that sounds either really crazy or romantic, I guess. In reality, we continued dating, moved to different cities, got engaged, had a long engagement. And three years and one week after we first met, we were married on May 12, 2012. Two years later, I found myself pregnant with my first child, our child. And while my pregnancy was relatively easy considering all the morning sickness and labor horror stories I'd heard, it was still filled with highs and lows, ups and downs. That's why in 2016, during the presidential campaign, when I heard an old news clip of then-candidate Trump say, pregnancy is inconvenient for businesses, I didn't snap my head aghast and in horror. I didn't feel offended or attacked as a woman by such a myopic and misogynistic worldview. I just, Kanye shrugged <laughs> and agreed because pregnancy is inconvenient. And before the feminists and the mom bloggers attack me, I must say the greatest word in the English language is mommy, especially when spoken by my precocious three-year-old son who is as stubborn as he is smart and as silly as he is opinionated. But the word to mommy is a long one, and it begins with the inconvenience of pregnancy. It starts in the first trimester when you don't really know you're pregnant and you're still partying and turning up and drinking. <laughs> and then you're like, ooh, mm, stop, something is not right. And then that suspicion turns into a test and that test confirms your suspicion and then all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, your husband is standing in front of you with your mother on the other end of the phone, ready for you to make a full confession that you are full with the fruits of grown-up activities and you haven't even seen a real doctor yet. <laughs> and you just kind of wanted to keep it secret, sacred, safe, at least for a little while. But even after my mother knew and the doctor confirmed what the pharmacy test already told me and they gave me a folder that was binder thick, of new and expectant mother information, I still felt like I was carrying this weight, this inconvenient truth, because you're not supposed to even tell anyone you're pregnant until after the first trimester, when your risk for a miscarriage diminishes. But it was at this time I was trying to prove myself for a promotion at my job, and I had to decide whether or not I was going to tell my bosses I was having a child. Everyone I know, my mother and my husband included, said, don't say anything. Wait until the decision is made. To me, that felt dishonest. So I opened my mouth and I told the powers that be, I'm having a kid. And a month and a half later, I found out I didn't get the promotion. Now, I don't think it's because I was pregnant, but sometimes I wonder, what if? What if I didn't say anything? It is these what if questions that keep pregnant women and working mothers up at night as we try to figure out this thing called work-life balance. But I could no more deny the coming of my son then than I can deny my skin color or my hair texture standing in front of you now. And that is why at 12 weeks in a few days, when my sonogram stopped looking more like a teddy gram or an alien and started to look more like a real human baby, I posted this picture and announced to the world via Facebook that 
I was having a kid. The congratulations rolled in, a gender reveal party was planned, and then I took this random trip to the hospital for a splitting side pain that I still to this day cannot explain. I laid on the squeaky hospital bed, doubled over in the fetal position, my body wrapped in a thin sheet, the bracelet with my name on it itching my wrist, wondering, what is wrong with me? The doctor came in and asked me, would it be okay if they evacuated the pregnancy in case of an emergency? And he asked me this with the casualness that you would ask someone if they want steak or chicken in their Chipotle bowl. There I was, barely pregnant, not even showing, and I was asked to choose between my life and the life of my unborn child. Luckily, the pain went away, it was some sort of phantom, and my pregnancy continued. But what if it didn't? What if it hadn't? What if I was in danger? What if I had to diagnose myself like Serena Williams did after giving birth to her daughter? Because doctors don't tend to believe women, especially black women, know their bodies enough to know that something is off, something is wrong, something is not right. It is the inconvenience of being stereotyped to be strong, strong enough to die for your children when you absolutely do not have to. Researchers writing in the Journal of Birth Issues and Perinatal Care found that 150,000 American women every year have severe complications, illnesses, or near-death experiences due to pregnancy or childbirth. 1,200 American women every year don't live to experience the joys of motherhood. And for black women, we are three times more likely to have a severe illness, complication, or die in childbirth than a white woman. The researchers found that a black woman in the United States is more likely to die during pregnancy or immediately after than a woman in a developing country. Here I was, laid up in the hospital in my first trimester, and I was just lucky to be alive. In the second trimester, I found out I was having a boy, and I immediately began shopping at Baby Gap and buying clothes because everything is necessary and cute in miniature size. Hashtag Throw it in the bag. <laughs> this is also the part of the pregnancy where things get a little easier. Your energy comes back to you. You're not so big that all you want to do is lay down on a pile of pillows that still provide no comfort. And you don't really have to worry about that miscarriage thing. Well, almost. This is all, but even with that said, there are still decisions to be made. As a working woman, I had to figure out what my life was going to look like when the baby came and I wasn't working. Was I going to get paid? For how long was I going to get paid? Was I going to get paid? Who do I call? The answer, the insurance company and my HR rep. Now, I don't know how many of you have sat on the phone with the insurance company for hours at a time doing paperwork, but it is worse than when you call the cable company and you get a representative that you know is in a call center in another country and the static plus a heavy accent grates your last nerve before you even announce your problem. But this was supposed to be the easy part of the pregnancy, right? It's also the part of the pregnancy when you start showing, just not enough so that people don't know if you're pregnant or just fat. <laughs> now, this might not sound like an inconvenience to you, but for me, a woman who knows she's mm, a little bit vain, it is an inconvenience, even if it is just to my ego. This is also the part of the pregnancy when the baby starts kicking randomly, incessantly, nonstop at all times. I told you I was a working woman. What I didn't tell you was that I had to be at work at 2 a.m. until my new manager decided, why don't you come in at 1? At 1 a.m., no one really wants to be awake. Okay, maybe if you're in college, it's cute. But <laughs> at 1 a.m., when you're working and you're pregnant and you're tired and all you can hear is your bed calling you to come back, you don't want to be there, but 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., I was at work, I was producing my shows, and my son was kick, 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 all morning long. Sometimes I would pop my own belly just to get him to stop. It didn't work. <laughs> he just poked me somewhere else. And then comes the third trimester. That's when life gets 
really real. You have to make a birth plan. Decide how you want to give birth. Do you want drugs? Do you want your child to be vaccinated? If so, how soon? You have to pick a pediatrician, a name, and make a thousand and one other decisions for this tiny life you will soon be responsible for. Now, there is a host of information on the internet and on apps that can try and make these decisions a little easier for you, but can all also be overwhelming. So much so that you forget that this time, this experience, this initiation into a special right of women is supposed to be loving, joyous, not overwhelming, not frustrating, not exhausting, not inconvenient. The saying goes, anything worth doing is worth doing well, and anything worth having is worth fighting for. But as a pregnant woman and as a mother, there is no barometer to gauge if what you are doing, you are doing well, and there is no litmus test to measure if the children you have fought so valiantly to bring into the world, you are raising them as productive members of society. There is only your gut feeling, and even that can be off with someone else moving around in there. It is the reason why deciding to tell an employer you're pregnant is inconvenient. It is the reason why deciding how much time to take off of work is inconvenient. It is the reason why deciding whether to nurse or put your baby on formula is inconvenient. It is the reason why trying to determine if the pain you feel, the offense you feel, the leaks and spots that you see and feel in your own body are real or just inconvenient. It is the reason why deciding to have a baby at all is inconvenient. Studies show that a woman's earning potential drops and her career slows down after her first child. If the wage gap were not already problematic enough, it is only exacerbated by children, meaning the injustice, the inequality, and the inconvenience of it all is worse for single mothers and mothers of color who only make 67 cents to every dollar a white man makes before they have a child. We can't afford to have our earning potential drop and our career slow down. I can't afford to have my earning potential drop and my career slow down, though if I'm being honest with you, in ways it already has. My son comes before everything, including my job. My job is demanding, stressful, overwhelming, time consuming. I work a lot of long hours and a lot of overtime. That is time away from my son, time I will never get back, time I have inconveniently decided is better spent elsewhere than with him so that I can better take care of him. Even with six weeks paid time off and another six weeks unpaid spent just to bond with my son, deciding to return to the job I needed over staying with the baby I wanted was more than just inconvenient. Feeling my breasts gorge with milk because my body knew my baby was hungry even though I was miles away was more than just inconvenient. Trying to pick a daycare and a nanny to look after my child who I knew would be better off with me was more than just inconvenient. It was gut-wrenching. Our country is driven by profits and results. Pregnancy and babies are seen as a liability to both, an assumption proven by the fact that only 10% of U.S. companies offer expanded family leave pay, according to a study by the Society of Human Resource Management, and only 15% of companies offer any level of paid time off to spouses and partners for newborns and adoptions. Our country is driven by profits and results, but you can't have profits and results without people, without communities. Pregnancy is seen as an inconvenience, but I'd argue it is the other way around. Our country's current business model is an inconvenience to pregnancy, to families, to mothers, to communities who support those businesses, shop at those businesses, and work at those businesses. You cannot have a business without a community of people to support it and patronize it, and you cannot have that community of people without the consistency of pregnancy. It is time we acknowledge who and what powers our world and invest in its beginnings, its roots, its national makings, instead of just acknowledging birth and the miracle of life as an inconvenient problem that will disappear if we ignore it. So what do we do? Attend your city council meetings, call your commissioners, call, email, or write your state representatives, your state senators, the mayor, the governor, 
Call, email, or write your U.S. representatives or U.S. senators, or even tweet the president. In 280 characters, tell those men who run the world and make decisions about what's necessary for life that mothers are necessary for life, women are necessary for life, pregnancy is necessary for life, and we are not going anywhere. We are here to stay, and we are not inconvenient. Thank you.